All right. So, so I think I'll just turn it over to Jessica. It's a fantastic topic. Uh, a, 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 a wonderful researcher to speak to us. And uh, we'll stop periodically at questions. Uh, you'll recall that uh, if you go to the participants list at the bottom, there's a raise a hand function. So you can kind of put your hand up um, uh, virtually there. Uh, Barry can notice that and periodically, uh, either when Jessica feels that there might be some questions or when Barry sees that we've got a bunch, we'll uh, stop and ask those and answer those questions. So uh, Jessica, thank you so much for being here and take it away. Great, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I actually put three question breaks in the talk uh, so we can try to keep things more dynamic and interactive. Um, so, all right, can everybody see that? Yes. <clears throat> all right, so back. yeah, thanks again for having me. Um, as Peter said, I'm from Santa Cruz. I, gosh, I guess I lived in Napa till I was about two and then we moved to Santa Cruz and I grew up in Santa Cruz on the west side. We lived in Capitola when I was little Then I grew up on the west side starting around sixth grade. Um, I went to Mills College in Oakland for my undergraduate degree. That still is an all women's undergraduate institution, which I did not appreciate at the time, but I think in hindsight really benefited me as studying the sciences. Um, so I've been at Cold Spring Harbor since 2014. After my PhD, I did postdoctoral work at UC San Francisco. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about Cold Spring Harbor as an institution for those of you who are not familiar with it. There we go. So this is a painting of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. We're on the North Shore of Long Island. We were founded in 1890. We're about an, a mile or an hour from, from New York City. Um, and it's an interesting place to work. It's a small research institution. We don't have any undergraduates. We're a nonprofit research institution. There's about 1,100 total employees. So really not very big, nothing like UC Santa Cruz. Um, but we, in addition to the scientists that we have, we're very well known in the scientific community for our meetings and courses. And so we have people come for meetings. Um, one of the first meetings I went to was a graduate student. In fact, the first talk I ever gave outside of my own group as a graduate student was at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Um, and it was really famous for having these meetings and courses for a long time. People in the 40s and 50s would come in the summer and bring their whole families and stay in like tents and then cabins and very rudimentary facilities um, really to have a lot of in-person scientific exchange. So we now have an additional Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory conference center in China in Suzhou, which is another kind of small, smaller city on the water. Um, so we also have a press, Cold Spring Harbor Press makes a lot of textbooks and also started BioArchive, which is a very important resource in modern science for getting um, papers out and disseminated quickly while they're still under a traditional peer review process. And this has played um, a big role recently in actually um, getting virus research stories out. So as when groups make a finding, they can share it and everyone can look at the data and comment on it and interpret it their own way while it's still being undergoing a kind of a traditional journal review process, which can take months or years. Um, and then we also have DNA learning centers. So we're very proud of our educational outreach. Um, we have uh, seven individual centers in the US, uh, mostly on the East Coast, but 30,000 students per year. This is middle and high school students come in and learn about DNA, genetics, and biology. And we also do teacher training. Um, so that teachers can go back into classrooms in their own communities. And there are international DNA learning centers now. I think our newest one is in Mexico City. Um, so with that, I'm going to get on to the, my topic today. And again, there's like three question breaks in the middle and we can spend some time. I have about 35 slides, but I think we have a couple hours. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, so the first thing I would like to remind everyone, and I actually use this slide in a lot of my scientific talks to other scientists, is that sex and gender are not interchangeable. They're not the same. You can't say gender when you mean biological sex, right? So um, so sex is, a, is the biological and physiological characteristics that can define men and women, but gender is uh, social and cultural roles. So gender is really a societal construct, things that society is decided or masculine or feminine. And in, in this case, I use the colors blue and pink, which are considered masculine and feminine, but I flipped them 
um, for the slide. Um, so these are things that, you know, people that from certain cultural backgrounds will identify as being male type or female type behaviors. And that's really what gender is, which is different from the underlying um, biology in an organism. Um, animals do not have gender. Um, there can, is actually, you know, some debate if you have a, you know, a, like primates or even elephants, you know, when there's actually social groups and almost um, societies, there are more gender roles in those groups. But um, this is a mistake I, that I hear a lot, um, even from scientists, is referring to the gender of their animals. And I don't know if it's just a, a squeamishness thing. People don't want to say the word sex, but it's, it's incorrect. Um, and it's important to, to consider that. So another little bit of background I wanted to give is about the National Institutes of Health, which are, is the principal funder of all biomedical and public health research in the US. Um, let's see if I can move this out of the way. There we go. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with it, there's 27 institutes and centers and all of the research that we do um, as scientists or um, people do in, in public health comes from these institutes and centers. So examples of that, the largest institute is the National Cancer Institute. Um, my funding comes from the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, there's the National Institute on Aging, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, which is actually the complete name of that is the Eunice Kennedy Shriver Institute of Child Health and Human Development. So she was on the original um, board that started this institute at the NIH. And you may also know her as the founder of the Special Olympics. Um, the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases is the one that's in the news now because that's the one that's directed by Dr. Fauci. Um, and what I wanted to highlight is that the, the budget for the entire National Institutes of Health is $37.3 billion, which seems like a lot of money, but if you break that down, the actual, the entire budget for the National Cancer Institutes, so that's all research, clinical trials, anything on cancer in this country, it's about $6 billion, and that's the same as the New York City Police Department budget per year. So, <laughs> um, but one thing that's really important that's kind of like underlying um, the rationale for my talk is that women were not required to be included in clinical trials until 1993. And this was actually something that was passed by Congress um, because up until this time, you know, many of the drugs, most common drugs on the market that have been used for decades are really only uh, had been tested in male subjects. Um, and in fact, female animals were not required in laboratory research until 2014, which is around when I started my own lab. Um, this was a big source of many gripes um, from scientists that had to suddenly go out and buy female rodents and start studying them for the first time. But my lab was studying that already, so it was nice for me. Um, so, so what is this? Why does it take so long for, for women to be and female animals to be included? Um, in, in trials. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but a common theme I want to have in my talk today is the idea that the biology of men and women is different and that this is not a problem, that different does not mean that one group is correct, right? Um, and I think even in scientists, there's been reticence to talk about this idea that men and women are different because then it could snowball into the idea that men are good at this and women are good at this and they should only do this one thing or the other thing. And that, you know, that obviously is not correct. So I'm, I'm highlighting here um, some examples of sex differences in the immune system. Um, so women have many more incidences of autoimmune disease than men do because the immune system is more active in women. Um, and that's people are trying to understand exactly how and why this is. And it seems to be because of um, hormones, estrogen and testosterone that I'm gonna talk about a lot today. So, um, on the other side, there's actually many cancers that have a male bias, and this is related to the fact that the immune system is so much more active in women that it's actually better at scavenging for these precancerous cells um, and contributes to the fact that women have lower rates of these cancers, right? So this is a very important aspect of biology that we would like scientists are trying to understand um, because by understanding the differences, then you can improve um, you know, our understanding of how to fight disease. Um, another example of a striking sex difference is um, in drug metabolism. Um, and this is another thing that can be influenced by, um, by hormone levels. And so, as I mentioned, many common medications were developed using only men. And this has been a real problem because women take these medications and they are not using the correct dosage. And so in 2014, um, the FDA recommended that the dose for Ambien be cut for women be cut in half. So Ambien was developed and tested only on men. 
And what happened is women that were taking Ambien at the recommended dose were taking it to go to sleep at night and then getting up in the morning, going to work and crashing their cars because they were still under the influence of Ambien. And there was actually an entire um, 60 Minutes episode in 2014 um, that Leslie Stahl uh, narrated about this, this issue, right? So this is a good example of um, a problem that can arise by there not being um, a diverse group of test subjects during development of drugs. Um, so sex differences are historically understudied. It's not just the clinical trials that have recruited men, but really in the lab, as I mentioned, people have studied largely male animals. Um, and part of this is because of this bias. So there was an article about this in the New York Times last year um, based on this editorial that was in the journal Science about the idea that um, uh, female animals have not been used because of this assumption that because females have an estrous cycle and their hormone levels fluctuate, this will lead to more variability in physiological parameters and that this will lead to more variability in your data and then it'll be too messy and hard to figure out what's going on between your experiment and control groups. So let's just not have females and then it won't be a problem. And so that is kind of this kind of assumed logic has been driving the, the use of primarily male animals in research for a long time. But when you actually do the analysis and you look at male animals and female animals, you know, in any given task, whether you're looking at, you know, blood pressure or behavior performance in a task or how the animals are metabolizing a drug, overall, the data from male and female animals are equally variable. Females aren't more variable. And this idea that hormones contribute to variability is really kind of this um, originally kind of Victorian idea that the hormones from the female reproductive organs were making women more emotional and more erratic. And although this is true that hormones can affect mood, what this ignores is that um, men also have hormones and men also have emotions and hormones can contribute to those emotions in men as well. But for some reason that has always been considered the default that is normal and any variability in women is kind of a problem that we need to avoid, right? Um, so understanding all of the variation in biology is key to fighting disease and acknowledging differences um, is very important to um, making sure that every aspect of biology is, is really understood. So um, as I mentioned, um, hormones are variable in both sexes. So what most people think about if they think about varying hormones is the menstrual cycle in, in humans or an estrous cycle in animals where estrogen and progesterone go up and down throughout the cycle, right? So what many people don't know is that testosterone also has a lot of variation. There's annual variation in testosterone. Testosterone levels in men are higher in the fall and lowest in the spring. There's daily variation. Um, so testosterone is highest in the morning and, and lowest in the evening. Um, and then also testosterone itself is, is secreted in a pulsatile fashion. So throughout the day, testosterone levels aren't at a baseline, but there's random spikes throughout the day. And the dynamic range of these changes in levels are just the same as the dynamic range in the female's um, menstrual cycle, right? So there are many things that can change testosterone levels in, in men. There's a very wide range of what's considered functionally normal. Um, and hormone changes are, 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 the way that hormones can influence the brain and behavior, it's plastic by design, by evolutionary design, because you don't want to spend your energy mating and fighting if you're in a stressful situation or if you're low on calories and you haven't seen food for a while as an animal. And so the idea that hormones act on the brain to affect behavior is something that's evolved in vertebrates to provide more behavioral plasticity. And this is a bonus that you don't always have to do the exact same thing, that the behavior you perform depends on the context and the in internal state that your body is in. And that's what hormones circulate throughout your body and tell different parts of your body what's going on. So one thing that's fun about testosterone is in both in animals and humans, there's a winner effect. So if an animal is in a fight with another animal and it wins, it gets this little bump of testosterone that's thought to be a kind of reward experience that helps the animal remember that it's success. And you can actually see these bumps in testosterone in humans when they're watching sports. If their own team will win, this victory kind of, woo, you know, people going out and possibly rioting and flipping buses over if their team wins the World Series, this, this winner effect um, is true, has been documented in animals and in humans. You don't even have to be the one that wins, you just have to be identifying with the winner. Um, also, um, testosterone actually goes down 
in uh, men that spend more time around their babies. And you can think about how, again, evolutionarily, that if you are going to be providing more care for offspring, then you're gonna be turning down kind of the drive for territorial aggressive behavior and maybe running around and trying to find new mates. And so turning testosterone down is, has associated um, with uh, men spending more time with their, with their infants. Um, so I have a couple more slides here and then I'm gonna pause for, for questions. Um, so I'm mostly talking about the brain today. And so one thing that's interesting is that there's also a lot of sex differences in um, mental health and psychiatric and neurological disorders. So you can see here on the far right that autism has a strong male bias. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion about actually how symptoms of autism may be different in, in boys and girls. And so girls are actually underdiagnosed because they don't present the same way boys do, or they might not be as disruptive. And so they don't get noticed by the teachers. Um, even and, But even on top of that, when, when um, people sequence the genomes of, of boys and girls with autism, it seems that girls who have autism actually have more damaging DNA mutations than the boys do. So there's something it's thought that is protecting um, girls from developing autism, even if they have the same mutations as boys, which is really interesting and something that my lab is doing research on. Um, so you can see also ADHD is um, and many early onset neurodevelopmental disorders are more common in boys. And then on the other side, um, Alzheimer's is more common in women. Um, there's actually, it's a two to one ratio. And uh, the other thing you might think at first is in, you know, on average women tend to live longer than men. And so maybe there's just more women with Alzheimer's because there's more older women, but it's, it's not that at all. There's still a higher incidence um, in women, even accounting for, for lifespan. Um, and then of course, depression and anxiety are, are more common, also two to one in women compared to men. Um, I just want to point out something about schizophrenia here that's interesting. So this graph on the left shows the age of onset of schizophrenia. So the incidence of schizophrenia is about the same in the two sexes, but boys tend to have their, well, men um, have their first break um, kind of in late adolescence. Um, but women show a second um, peak in, uh, for first time onset of symptoms around menopause. Um, and so there's something that's thought to be possibly precipitated by the more dynamic fluctuations of hormones in perimenopause that can predispose women to tipping into schizophrenia that have not previously. But one other thing that's interesting is that um, women with schizophrenia diagnoses tend to do better than men. Um, they respond better to treatment, they have fewer hospitalizations, and they even have different symptoms. So the positive symptoms of schizophrenia are the ones that I think people think about in the media the most are the kind of like hallucinations. Um, but the negative symptoms, withdrawal, depression, lack of affect, those are also extremely problematic um, and they are more common in men. And there's actually currently no treatments for the negative symptoms. There's only treatments for the positive symptoms, the stuff that normally um, you know, is not displayed by a, by a healthy person. So I'm gonna stop here with this background and see if anybody has any questions about anything I've said so far. I can actually turn that off. Questions for Jessica? Uh, I've got one. Uh, Jessica, it, 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 it's probably hard to disentangle uh, with so many factors, but is the longevity of women a uh, sex or a gender issue? Is it risky behaviors and vocations? Yeah. It, uh, or is it all things, you know, if you take all those, those diseases and add them up, are women just naturally going to live longer? So there's definitely like things like risky behavior is more common in males, but there's also this interesting phenomenon where um, there tends to be more vulnerability in males in general. So there's actually more baby boys born than baby girls, um, but they tend to, on average, like there's always, basically the, the there's more <laughs> tails with males, there's in, in the distribution, right? So things like um, height, cognitive ability, brain size, the range of what, it, what males have is higher than what females have. And so there's this um, idea that there is more variability in the population and that this could be advantageous, again, for having variability in, in, in a population, like for having a group survive, but that it also means that there's more um, deleterious traits um, that happen in males. And part of this is thought to be because of the sex chromosomes, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But why it is that women live longer, I think there are many biological and cultural factors that can contribute to that, right? 
um, certainly the having the immune system, um, hormones themselves seem to be protective for a long time, but then there's a lot of social components as well and you know how people manage their emotions or interact with each other. So that's it's really difficult to uh, to really pick out what it is. It's many things, right? Okay, we got at least four questions here. Let's start with Darby. Yeah, um, I kind of got stuck on the first slide, the the differentiate between sex and gender, and I wondered about the term transgender. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's a correct name or a misnomer? No, I think it's correct because that's that's someone's sense of themselves. And when I say that animals don't have gender, it's kind of like you, they don't have theory of mind, <laughs> right? Like there's no the idea that that you know you are a person and that you believe yourself to be or you know that you are a certain way is something that requires kind of a higher consciousness that um you know we maybe some animals have them but no i, I don't think that transgender is is, is in, incorrect um it's more the idea that people assign the term gender to to animals which it's really um you know what's what makes something gendered is sort of defined by society a lot right uh, and yet some of these people that are in this category they seem to have known as children, young children, that they were yeah. in the wrong body is how they put it. Yeah, so I'm actually, I'm gonna talk about that uh, okay. a little later specifically because there is biological evidence that um, that this that there are things you can point to that are, are different in the brain in, in boys and girls that seem to be swapped in Constantine. some individuals. Constantine, in it. <clears throat> I, I'm, unmute you? yourself, Constantine. You're muted. Uh, there. 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 there you go. Yep. Okay. So I wondered if the insurance companies, health insurance companies, have gotten your data to so that they indeed can now appropriately uh, rate um, their, their various potential clients. So, you know, the rates could be up or down depending on if you're male or female. Well, I think for car insurance, it actually is already there. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know about medical insurance, but I believe that that car insurance for teenage boys is more expensive than for teenage girls because there's a lot of data on that. Uh -huh. Well, I'm just wondering because this would either save or, you know, increase Absolutely. money if you're being insured by being insured that take all the statistical things and put them together. So you're, you're not aware of that, though. No, I don't know. I don't know how insurers calculate rates, but yeah, you would think you could imagine that it, yeah. it, men are more liable <laughs> for this or for that. Yeah. Or women are more liable for this or for that. That's interesting. Anyway, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. Nancy and Joel. So um, I'm fascinated by this idea that animals don't have gender, but animals do have culture and they do have uh, roles that the different sexes, shall we say, play. Uh -huh. So does it really never happen that, for example, a male lion wants to hang out with his cubs or that uh, a, a female chimpanzee becomes the alpha? I mean, I, 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 Franz Duval has written about an alpha female chimpanzee. And is that, would you say that that was a gendered role or is that just? Yeah, what, what I, I actually did say that caveat. I think, you know, some higher primates or like I said, even elephants or possibly dolphins, you know, these, that, these animals that have social groups, almost societies where there's certain roles, right? For certain individuals. Um, I think that's, I'm actually going to talk about primates and toys in a little bit. So, oh, um, but yeah, it's some of these things, you know, it, it this is one of the problems where they where it's thought well the expectation for for what a boy does or for what a girl does does that come from society yes but it seems like these things are generalized across other species even so there's some there's some innate underlying um, principles okay. yeah I'll talk more about that it's a good question okay Peter and and unmute yourself hey hi um. This is Olivia. This is uh, Marvin's granddaughter, um, and, Hi, Olivia. and she's she's been fascinated with uh, uh, sex and the brain and how how it all works for a long time. So when I told her about this talk, she got real excited. Um, my first question is since I don't remember the second one, but um, the first one is. 
you said that you went to a girl, like an all girl school, and you said that it was pretty awesome. Why was it awesome? So I went to, when I went to college, I went to uh, a school that, right, it was only women, girls in my science classes. And I think that um, a lot of girls don't speak up when the boys are doing all the talking. This is not true for everybody, but there's, it, it's, it can happen where um, many girls don't speak in class as much as boys do. And when you're in a class where there are no boys, especially when you're in science classes um, or math classes or things where maybe traditionally, although really not so much anymore, I hope, you know, girls were thought that taught that they weren't supposed to do those things as much as boys. Um, when there's only girls in your science and math classes, um, then all of the girls speak. And I think in, in college, it was, it was something that I didn't, I didn't actually go there because of that. I went there because I wanted to stay in the Bay Area and I really liked the school and it was very pretty. Um, but I think it made me more confident in myself because I was actually the loud person. <laughs> and so, um, and all of my friends in my science classes were, were women as well. And so it was just a nice environment to be in. And I now as a professor have met many other colleagues who also went to women's like colleges. Um, so it just, I think was just gave me an extra place to be myself and be confident in my choices. Okay. Is it possible to ask like two other quick questions? Sure, go ahead. Uh, the, one of the other ones was, um, oh, you want to do the bunny one? Oh, okay, so she just I got two bunnies. Got two bunnies. One's a boy, one's a girl. Um, we put them together yesterday, and the girl started humping the boy. Yes. So that happens with many animals. So that happens with my mice in my lab. You can have a cage of just girl mice, and they will all hump each other it's a social dominance behavior that is separate from actually mating right so maybe she's letting him know that she's in charge of the cage you have <laughs> and you wouldn't call that you wouldn't call that a gender role well but no we wouldn't actually that's that's a good example so we wouldn't call it gendered because right then thinking about what it means to be the the dominant one is that is that in our minds maybe that's more masculine but for animals that's not true Right. Mm. So, um, so in my, in my lab, we work with mice and we tend to keep them in all male or all female cages, unless we're putting them together to make babies. And there are dominance hierarchies that are maintained by so like dominance mounting behavior in the same sex cages. And that's just, you know, they, they also will kind of scuffle around and one will be the alpha, even in the group of females. That's just, that's just how they do it. That's a good so question. The, the, the last one was, uh, so as Olivia is coming into this world and when you, when you see things, it just sort of, at first you just sort of accept it as just, well, that's just how it is, right? That's just the way it is. But as you point out that um, as you are entering into science, there's all these places where women were, were and maybe are underrepresented in scientific studies. Yeah. Uh, f for the benefit of all of us, but also for the benefit of Olivia, who's, who's walking into this world, accepting it as it is, as we all do at the age of eight. Um, what are the things that, where, where are other places where women are underrepresented in the science data? Do you see any others? So actually, that's a good question. Women are still funded at lower rates and, um, and minority scientists are still suffering from being funded at lower rates. So we all write out grant applications and try to get money from the NIH. And um, there's, there are still people have done these like blinded studies, right? That, that women's funding rates are not as successful. Everyone has these implicit biases, right? So everyone has to go through and check now and like make sure that, you know, women are going to be funded at the same rates. They're applying at lower rates because there's fewer of them, but even given that, they're funded at the lower rate for how many apply. And so one thing that's interesting is I recently served on a study section and all of the grants were on understanding sex differences in disease and understanding women's health. And the people who submitted those grants were almost entirely women. So even by having a study mm -hmm. section to address sex differences in disease, a side effect of that is that more women scientists got funded. 
because more women scientists are interested in these topics. And there's a similar um, problem um, with underrepresented groups because many minority scientists are interested in public health issues that are traditionally not as maybe flashy as other aspects of science. And so those people are getting underfunded because they're trying to improve their communities and that is a less of a priority for many people. And so, you know, this is why people have to keep track of the data so that people can be aware of, of you know, how, how these choices get made. Okay, I'd I like think to make we'll, a we'll have two, two questions. So we'll let Nancy make a quick comment and then Mark and John. My quick comment has to do with the fact that uh, I was hired at NIMH in Bethesda in 1957 uh, to be the assistant of a woman who was doing a research uh, at that time, uh, in what seemed very important, uh, she was doing twin studies on schizophrenics. Wow. And uh, so I, I was a psychologist, she, that was her field. Her name was Margaret Singer. Uh, and she became quite well known later for her work with uh, uh, people who had been through some kind of brainwashing. And, and uh, I think she, People might even remember some of those studies. But anyhow, just so you know that back as far as 57, mm -hmm. she was there, a woman scientist, and I got hired. <laughs> so uh, it didn't seem out of the question. Okay. Mark and Jenna, I think you get the last for this round, and then we'll go back to the presentation. I just wanted to point out that in addition to uh, bias and um, noisy baselines, um, women of childbearing potential are excluded from clinical trials for safety reasons. Yep. That, yeah, that's, that's all. That started, I just wanted to, yeah. That started because of thalidomide. Um, and so, yeah, so that's a really good point, right? It's like you have to, you don't want to, the idea that of course you don't want someone who is pregnant to be taking an experimental drug, somehow it gets lumped to like anyone that could have a child will just not <laughs> will just not count you because you might be pregnant and not know it or it's it's almost paternalistic in some ways right like um, and it's it's losing well, I think I think it's a legitimate concern when you're dealing with an experimental drug that you don't want to take any chance of damaging um, a baby and you don't know how long that what that drug will do to this um, this uh, female system so yeah, I mean, hopefully those, the idea that a drug would damage a, a developing egg would have been tested. That's something you would test for in, in animals before you started putting it in people at all. But yeah, it's right. a really good point. But are you gonna take that risk? <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, I'm gonna go back here. All right. Okay, so um, as, as you may know, likely everyone knows, is that um, that biological sex is determined both by your genes and by your hormones that are made from the gonads, right? So um, in humans, um, women have two X chromosomes and men have an X and a Y. There's actually many sex chromosome aneuploidies out there. Um, so there are individuals that can have slightly different numbers of X's and Y's and um, interest in the, in or maybe even some of those cells would have slightly different numbers of X's and Y's. And um, so there's X, there's XXY, um, and um, there's a wide variation of, of biology there as well. Um, and so um, one thing that's important to thinking about um, why women might live longer or why men might be more vulnerable is this idea, right? Each chromosome, there's a pair, and there's, so that means there's two copies of every gene that you have. But for genes that are on the X chromosome, men only have one copy. And so if you have a mutation in one of those genes, there isn't another copy of that gene to sort of rescue that function. So there are many um, um, uh, genes associated with severe mental retardation that are genes that are on the X chromosome um, because males will have a fairly strong phenotype if they're losing a copy of one of those genes and compared to females. And in fact, there's a gene, there's a disease called, called Rett syndrome, um, which is a very devastating disease where the children are born, uh, and seem pretty much normal. And then around 18 months to two years completely deteriorate and lose all the skills that they've had. And in that case, um, 
it, the patients are almost entirely girls because the boys, it's a lethal mutation. So the idea that there's sex differences in, in resilience or vulnerability, a lot of that can come from um, mutations that are that the males have a more severe effect from having that mutation because they don't have an extra copy. Is it lethal in utero? Uh, yeah, yeah, or even or in utero or, or, or very early in life. Yeah, there are like a few males that have this disease, but the mutation is in like a slightly different part of the gene that's less of a problem. Um, but yeah, there's other um, fragile X is another uh, mental retardation condition that is from a mutation on the X chromosome and boys have a disease and girls generally do okay because they have a normal functioning gene. Um, okay, so what I'm going to be talking about mostly today and what my research focuses on is, is gonadal hormones. So hormones made by the testes, testosterone or made by the ovaries, estrogen and progesterone. Um, and one thing I wanna highlight is that these things are not completely binary, right? Women also have testosterone, men also have estrogen and progesterone, um, and that there are other parts of the body that can make these hormones. So the adrenal glands that make, make cortisol, your stress hormone, they also can make some testosterone. Um, fat can, and bones can make estrogen. Um, and these hormones can even be, some of them can be made uh, directly uh, in the brain themselves. But the majority of what's in your circulation, right, this hormone is secreted into your circulation. It goes around and can, can uh, influence the, the function of, of all of your cells. Um, so my lab studies how hormones act on the brain to influence behavior, right? And so this is something that for, for hormones, certainly hormones like testosterone, we've known for, for millennia, right, that, you, that these hormones affect your behavior. This is why people get their pets fixed because you're trying to turn down these hormone regulated behaviors like mating or territory marking by peeing everywhere um, or aggression, right? So the idea that testosterone relates to aggression is, is very well understood, but why and how is something that we're still working on, right? There's a hormone, it does something in your brain and it changes your behavior, but there's a very large black box in the middle um, that's an active area of research. So a fundamental uh, concept I want to get across that's really important to understanding the actions of hormones is that the hormones float around. So here I've schematized them in blue. The um, steroid hormones themselves are, are, are fatty. They can pass directly into your cells from the circulation. They don't need to bind a sur surface receptor. Um, and they bind these receptors, which I've schematized here as kind of little boot things. Um, but the receptors themselves, the proteins that the hormones bind to, to, to exert their effects, they can sit down directly on the DNA. And so that means that genes can be turned up or turned down very rapidly in response to changing hormone levels. And this is something that's very unique about uh, steroid hormones. Their hormone receptors are called nuclear receptors because they can go, they sit right in the nucleus where your DNA is. So most signaling molecules in your cells, they'll maybe bind a receptor kind of like on the surface of the cell, and then there'll be a bunch of proteins and signaling things communicating to each other. But hormones can go right in, sit on the receptor, and the receptor sits on the DNA, and they can change um, the genes that are expressed in an hour, right? So all cells in your body more or less have the same DNA in them, but they're only expressing, they're only making RNA and protein out of a subset of those genes, and that's what gives the cell its own identity and function. And hormones can directly control that in a very rapid way. So my lab is studying how hormones regulate gene expression in the brain. Um, so now where I'm trying to get at part of this black box between hormones and behavior is really understanding what are the genes in the brain in different parts of the brain that are turned on by these hormones and how do they influence how a neuron, the principal cell in your brain that fires and regulates behavior, how does this really work? Um, so as I just said, like the receptor for estrogen, estrogen receptor, and so also the receptor for testosterone is called androgen receptor. These things can bind DNA and they can turn genes on and off. And so this means that male and female brains can express different genes because of their, their different levels of hormones. So even though both male and female brains have androgen receptor and have estrogen receptor in them, the amount of hormone available for those receptors can, can vary, right? And so many of these differences um, are actually set up in early life. It's not just hormones in adulthood that change, change your brain, but hormones that, your, that the fetus sees or that um, a baby will see. Um, so I have a little schematic here of, of hormone levels in a human. And so you can see what I've just shown on the right is this idea that testosterone levels go up in males around puberty. 
Um, again, as I said earlier, you know, this is not a steady state. There's fluctuations of testosterone, but it's, you know, it's more or less um, how things go. Whereas um, what, what many people don't know is there's also surges of testosterone in early life. So there's a surge in infancy and there's also a very prolonged surge in mid gestation. So during the second trimester, the testes of the fetus are secreting testosterone um, and the levels are elevated. You know, this is a schematic, but, but almost as high as, as puberty. Um, and then, and then females, of course, have cycling estrogen and progesterone um, starting at puberty. There's also a, a fetal surge of estrogen, or an infant, excuse me, an infant surge of estrogen that I've sort of um, dotted here because we don't know very much about this infant surge, and it's just not as well studied um, as the surge in boys of testosterone. Um, so a four to six month old baby has quite a bit of testosterone and the levels of estrogen, you know, the duration and how much is normal, it has not really been very well studied. But what we do know a lot about actually is the mid gestation testosterone. And that's because you can measure it from when women have amniocentesis. So if you're pulling out the amniotic fluid to check for other things, you can always check testosterone levels. And so um, we know a lot about the timing of um, and the, the levels of testosterone um, in, in, in the human fetus. So, um, so as I, one of the questions alluded to earlier, um, so fetal testosterone levels actually can correlate with childhood toy preferences and rough and tumble play. So there are differences between boys and girls that seem to be truly innate and not just from society, but it's very difficult to, to separate these two things, right? So I'm showing data here from a paper where they present um, boys and girls with either a masculine toy or a feminine toy. So the feminine toys in these experiments have, um, they tend to be baby dolls or soft toys, whereas the masculine toys have wheels and are um, some sort of truck or vehicle, right? And so when you, when you look at this, you can see here that um, um, the, the male children tend to prefer with the masculine, play with the masculine toys compared to the feminine toys. Whereas the girls actually play with both more, right? The girls play with the girl toys and they play more with the boy toys, but the boys stay away from the girl toys. And so there's a question about, well, is this, um, is this really society, right? Is society, it's kind of maybe okay more for girls to play with trucks than it is for boys to play with dolls. And, you know, this data was collected, well, not that long ago, actually, right? But people have been doing this for a long time. And there are actually many, um, there are, of course, girls who play with trucks and boys toys. But if you take a group of children and you look at the distribution, this is a very consistent thing that shows up over and over. Um, the other thing that shows up over and over is rough and tumble play. Um, anyone who has boys, versus girls or has been around boys versus girls. I have two boys um, and they just, you know, they fight and turn things into guns. And um, this, this rough and tumble play is a, is a male trait that is true um, in humans and is also true in primates. And it's even true in lab rats that rats play with rough and tumble fighting play and boys do it more, the male rats do it more than the females. Um, so again, right, society is, you know, kids grow up and they're given pink stuff or blue stuff. And these messages come to kids from very early in life, um, often about what's appropriate for boys or girls. But an interesting thing here is that monkeys show the same distribution in toy preferences. And so the same experiment was done giving monkey children um, a male toy or a female toy. And here you can see the picture. These are just examples, but the girl monkeys will prefer to go and play with the toy. And they actually like try to inspect it and kind of treat it like monkeys actually would treat a baby. And the boys spend more time with the boy, the male monkeys, the young male monkeys spend more time with the boy toys. Um, again, it's hard to say, like, is this really, you know, girls, girl monkeys spend more time with maybe with their moms watching the moms. Are they spending more time? I actually don't know enough about this biology of this species. These are vervet monkeys. Um, presumably young primates spend as much time around their mothers, but the girls tend to pick up this behavior where the girls will approach the baby doll um, and the boys don't. Um, so um, as I said, the um, Fetal testosterone levels correlate with childhood toy preferences. Okay, so what does this exactly mean? So there's a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which um, the adrenal gland um, becomes enlarged and hyperactive in the developing fetus. 
Um, and because, as I said, the adrenal not just produces, doesn't just produce stress hormones, but it also produces testosterone that girls with congenital adrenal hyperplasia have a lot more testosterone as developing fetuses than normal girls do. And the, this condition is usually diagnosed at birth and, and managed with treatment because you don't wanna have hyperactive adrenal. Um, but so that means that these girls do not have high testosterone after birth, but they do have high testosterone during development. And when you go and you do these experiments with these girls, these girls um, are more, when they grow up, they're, they look like girls, they're raised as girls, um, but they still prefer boys' toys. Um, so here you can see that girls with congenital adrenal hyperplasia are more likely to spend time playing with boy toys compared to other girls, whereas boys that have it are no different from unaffected boys. And then this is a totally different study from the other one I showed, but the same thing is true here. Like boys just do not play with girls' toys, even though the girls will play with boys' toys. Um, and girls with congenital adrenal hyperplasia don't play with girls' toys as much as uh, unaffected girls do. So there does seem to be behavioral correlates with what happens to test with testosterone levels in early life. Um, these girls also, there are separate studies showing girls that have high testosterone do engage in more rough and tumble play and show more aggression um, leading even up into adolescence. Um, okay, so as I've mentioned before, um, early onset neuropsychiatric disorders are more common in males. So autism, ADHD, developmental language disorders, dyslexia, all more common in boys. Um, is this perhaps because of early testosterone that boys see and girls do not? Um, and then adolescent onset mood disorders are more common in women. So depression, eating disorders, anxiety, these are all more common in women and they only show up after adolescence. And is there, are these possibly related to cycling, estrogen and progesterone? Um, there is evidence for this, especially for, for eating disorders actually. Um, so our central hypothesis in the lab is that understanding hormone responsive genes will help us under, uh, understand sex differences in disease susceptibility. If we know more about what these hormones are actually doing in the brain, then we can maybe understand why one sex or the other is more likely to develop a certain condition. Um, and that's really kind of our overarching goal in our research. Um, so as I've said before, also we, we don't study people, we study mice. So this is a mom with some newborn mice in the lab. Um, so many sex differences in behavior are evolutionarily conserved in mice. Um, there's maternal behavior, there's different kinds of mating behaviors in males and females, and then mice engage in, males engage in resident intruder aggression. So um, if you have a male in a cage and you bring in a new male, that male is going to fight to protect his territory and the female does not do that. And so what we do in the lab is we can manipulate hormones in early life or in adulthood and see how that changes the genes or how, or how it changes these animals' behaviors. Um, so in mice, I talked about these testosterone surges in human. Another nice thing that makes mice simple to study in this way is they have a surge of testosterone on the day that they're born. Um, and this is again schematized here. They have this little surge, this pulse. It's gone from the circulation within 12 hours. And work that's been done since the 40s and 50s has shown that this early testosterone is really necessary for sex differences in behavior in adulthood. So people originally were doing these studies, I think, in guinea pigs, where they were treating the mom with testosterone late in gestation. And the female offspring from that mom would grow up and be more aggressive to males um, like their male siblings. And then conversely, sexual receptivity, this idea that a female will let a male mount is something that uh, rodents only do when they're in estrus. So when they're ovulating, rodents will, uh, female rodents will allow a male to mate. Otherwise they don't do that. Um, and you can take a male and you can gonadectomize him. You can remove the testes, castrate him and, and give him, pump him full of estrogen and progesterone, um, but he's not going to be sexually receptive because the, the neural pathways that regulate that behavior have not formed because early testosterone blocks that. So this idea that early hormones have a long-term effect on, the, on adult behavior has been really known for a long time. And another interesting twist um, that's kind of uh, conceptually complicated, but I hope everyone understands, um, is that the testosterone in the circulation is actually converted into estrogen directly in the brain. Um, and this is very surprising to me, actually. This is not something that I learned in any of my training. I didn't learn about this until I was in my postdoctoral studies. Um, but testosterone, this, I put the molecule up here, you can see testosterone and estrogen are actually very similarly shaped molecules. Um, the only difference is down here. There's this hydroxyl group in the estrogen 
um, that's a double bond in the testosterone, they're almost the same thing. And there's this enzyme called aromatase that converts testosterone into estrogen. And this is part of how estrogen is normally made in its normal biosynthesis. All of these hormones actually start off as cholesterol and then are kind of modified and made into different sex hormones. Um, so there's a lot of aromatase in the ovaries because the ovaries are what's making estrogen. And this is the final step in making estrogen is, is uh, this conversion by aromatase. Um, but the interesting thing is that there's estrogen, there's aromatase in certain parts of the brain. So in these male mice, um, there's testosterone in the circulation at birth, and that testosterone is converted into estrogen directly in the brain. So it's actually the early estrogen that's causing this long-term masculinization. And I'm going to uh, explain that again with a video clip here. So here we have two adult animals. We have a white male and a black female. And we have given this female estrogen and progesterone to put her in estrus, so she will allow the male to mate. So you'll see the male will come up, he'll mount the female, and he'll start mating and she's holding still and she's letting him mount because she has she is an estrus and she has estrogen and progesterone. Um, in the second video, we also have a ma male and a female and this female was given estrogen and progesterone, but we also gave her estrogen during her first week of life, trying to mimic the estrogen that the male brain sees early, but normally the ovaries are quiescent in the female. So now the same, when we do the same experiment, the male enters the cage and tries to mate with this female that smells like a female to him. But what happens is instead of being sexually receptive, she's responding by displaying territorial aggression and fighting the male off, which is something that females never do normally, but her brain, because it saw estrogen early, has been permanently masculinized. And these male aggressive circuits have formed instead of these female sexual receptivity circuits because the brain saw estrogen early. And so our central questions in the lab are what are these genes regulated by this early estrogen and how do they influence brain development? Uh, what genes are regulated by the adult hormones and how do they impact an animal's behavior? And then really what are the other factors that cooperate with estrogen receptors to regulate genes in neurons? So estrogen receptors have been very widely studied in the context of breast cancer where they promote tumor proliferation and metastasis. Okay, estrogen is not doing that in the brain neurons actually don't even divide. And so there's something that causes specificity that makes estrogen turn on different genes in the brain compared to what it turns on in the ovaries or the mammary gland or the uterus. And we wanna understand that specificity. So I'm gonna take another question break here. Yeah. And I've got like nine more slides, so. Okay, I, I had one, Jessica, so that, that very early uh, testosterone spike. Is that mm -hmm. what induces the formation of male genitalia, et cetera, or is that beforehand? So in humans, yeah, there's, there's, um, that's, yes. So the, it's kind of complicated. So the actual development of the male reproductive tract. So in early embryogenesis, right, the, the embryo is, appears anatomically neutral. There's, it's actually the having the Y chromosome that there's a gene on the Y chromosome called SRY that regulates this cascade that allows the kind of bipotential gonad to differentiate into testes. So if you took that SRY gene off the Y chromosome, actually, and there are humans that have these mutations, um, the gonads will develop as female, even though the individual is, is chromosomally male, right? Because there's this one important Y chromosome gene. Um, and then, so the, so the testes have developed in this fetus, they're developing and they start secreting the testosterone, right? So there is always an interplay. You have to have that Y chromosome to make the testes, but then what the testes secrete, the, that hormone is really responsible for acting kind of non-cell autonomously, acting distally. Um, like in our mice, we do not see SRY expression in the adult brain. Um, yeah. Okay, other question, Pete? Got a question here. Um, so you, you're showing differences in sort of aggression and dominance, uh, you know, occurring early on. I wonder if there's been research on caregiving. Now, there was a study that said if you want to um, live a long life, get a a woman doctor because they're actually interested in the medicine, whereas the guys just want to make money. That's a gross generalization. But um, is there any 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 studies along that line? Well, one thing I was going to say, actually, I, there was a study recently that showed that as the percentage of doctors, is the percentage of women doctors in a specialty goes up, the average salary for that specialty goes down. Mm -hmm. 
So <laughs> primary care physicians are paid where that it's almost like a 50-50 ratio or even more women uh, for pediatricians um, are paid way less than like an orthopedic surgeon, which is almost, they're almost entirely men. Um, so that's an interesting, um, but it's also been over time as more and more women move into a specialty, the pay becomes relatively less compared to the other specialties. Um, but yes, yeah, so there's actually quite a bit of research into caregiving behavior in rodents and the propensity for males and females to display caregiving behavior varies widely across species and even across rodent species. Um, and one thing that my lab research is that I'm actually not gonna really, was didn't put in my slides today, um, is we study other rodents uh, that are voles. Um, and there's different, there are many species of voles, but we study particularly prairie voles because prairie voles have biparental care and they also form lifelong pair bonds. And so we're interested in um, the neurobiology underlying this pair bond formation and how they have these adult attachments. Because if you separate a bonded pair, they can actually get depressed and die. They really prefer to be with each other. Um, and so it's an interesting model for, for so social isolation and for understanding you know, um, when people have social attachment deficits and different disorders. So in, in the mice that I study in the lab, the dads, the ma males are not good dads. Um, but there are, um, there are other rodent species where the dads will actually go. One of the things we study is pup retrieval behavior. So you can put all the, you can scatter the pups around the cage and the mom will go and pick them all up and bring them back to the nest. And in these other species, the dads will do it too. Um, and so what it is that causes one species for the dads to be, to do this innately and the other ones don't is, is a, a another central question in this field. Um, you know, many species like um, you know, seahorses, there's poison dart frogs where there's paternal care. There are many, many species, not just mammals, um, like birds actually, right? The, the, the fathers help take care of the offspring. And so understanding that drive and the interplay between having that drive and having male behavior, right? Birds are still territorial, but the dads also are involved in caregiving. Um, and so that's another, that's another um, interesting area of research. So two quick things. Uh, do we think that that this caregiving is moderated by hormones in these mm -hmm. other animals. Yeah. And then, then, the, then the point I'd like to make is that I think this talk ought to be part of biology 101 in the ninth grade. <laughs> I guess it probably isn't. But the more I think about it, this separation of sex and gender is something that we, as, as an example, Barry is running another course on, on capitalism. And we find that that the, the so we have, in sex, we have physical uh evolution and gender we have cultural evolution and we find that that we've evolved our economic system saying gee if we don't have enough people let's put women to work and even better they'll work cheaper and and we have control over cultural evolution and maybe we should be conscious of it. so anyhow if, if there's anything we can do to see that there's at least two pages in the next biology textbook on your research, that would be very cool. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. There's a good, um, there is a good textbook on this um, that is at an undergraduate level. But it is interesting that the history of the field, I think the people that learn this stuff more actually tend to be the psychology majors and not the biology majors, because very traditionally, the people studying innate animal behaviors were coming from a psychology background um, and not so much like a cellular molecular biology background, which is what my background is in. Um, I didn't learn a lot of this stuff, like I said, in, in, until I was way along in my training. And most of the neuroscientists I meet now didn't learn this stuff in their training. Um, it just didn't come up. And and I think, again, there's there's been an absence of research into sex differences because it's it's been tricky. Either people don't want to do it or they don't want to think about it for different personal reasons. Or, you know, I, I don't know very much about how the placenta functions. I don't remember learning about that in Biology 101. And that's a pretty important organ. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Right. Mark, Mark and Jenna, you're muted. Uh, yeah, no, Mark, no, no, Mark, Mark, you're, you're muted. muted. Okay. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, experiment that was done. Was at a high level of uh, fetal. Uh, I guess it was testosterone or. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to have implications for setting something like sexual preference yeah. for a lifetime. 
uh, based on, on uh, hormone exposures possibly in the womb. And, and I think I've heard something about that in the past that that seemed to have some correlation with homosexuality. Um, yeah, for these girls with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, they do report more same-sex relationships in adulthood also. Um, but it, again, it's very tricky separating out in an animal model system, uh, gender identity versus sexual preference um, versus, yeah, like in, internal versus external. And um, so like even in these mice videos that I showed, right, the, the, the thing that's interesting there is that that female's brain is permanently masculinized. And I don't think it knows that it's male versus female because it's a mouse. Um, but another interesting behavior that that is, is different between the sexes and mice is, is territory marking. So if you put an animal in an empty cage, the male will pee around the cage to kind of mark the territory and the female will pool all the urine in the corner. <laughs> um, and you can actually see this when you change your group animals, group housed animals cages, because the females have a dirty spot and the males are everywhere. Um, but um, but this, these animals that we we gave the females estrogen at birth, they also territory mark as a Adults. And that's something that's interesting to me because it's it's not even in how they're engaging in behavior with another individual, but there's this innate drive that is different now in these females that saw it, that were exposed to estrogen early, right? So there are really fundamental shifts and ex figuring out exactly which neurons have changed and how is has been the work of many labs. Okay, uh, Margie? You're muted. You're muted, so uh, unmute yourself. Okay. So the bottom uh, left corner is a little microphone and just click on that and it should say mute, unmuted. Okay, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Am I on? Yes, yes, okay. I can hear you. Yeah. About 20 years ago, maybe even more, there was a series of articles in the New York Times where it was right after, uh, right at the time they were really looking at the genome. And they looked at the X and the Y, and they pulled out things that seemed to be traits, if you will, that mm -hmm. seemed to be on each of those um, chromosomes. And I'm wondering, are you familiar with that research? And has it been replicated or has it been uh, disqualified? Do you know anything about that? Um, yeah, I mean, there are definitely traits that are, that are coming from, from one side or the other. Um, it's really hard to find a single gene that contributes to a single trait. Um, sometimes there'll be like some protein that's really necessary for function, like uh, the gene that's mutated in cystic fibrosis, right? We know that that's one gene. Um, but yeah, the, that it's kind of your question speaks to what I was saying earlier about um, the fact that females, if it's something's on the X, then females have two versions of this gene and males only have one. And this can make males more variable than females across many, many traits. Um, so one trait that um, the Y chromosome actually doesn't have very many genes on it. Um, there's been a lot of talk about how it's kind of shrunk over evolution and it's really used to just sort of kickstart the process of developing the male reproductive tract. But the other genes that are on there, we don't understand very much about them. Whereas the genes on the X chromosome, absolutely. Um, there's a lot on there that are, are contributing. I guess one thing I should say um, is uh, that's important is that uh, women in their cells have X inactivation. And so even though there's two X chromosomes in every cell, in, in one of them is kind of shrunk up and pushed off to the side and not used very much. And that's how they, it's called dosage compensation, but it's how it, practically speaking, um, there's only one X operating in every woman's cell. So there's one X in the women that's functional and it balances out the one X that's there in the male. Um, but then the thing is, is that the X that gets inactivated and pushed to the side, it's kind of a random process. And so um, that that also uh, the the understanding that process and which genes are on the X is is a big area of research. Um, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but now that we know we know where the genes are in the human genome, we also know where the genes are in the mouse genome, and then we can look in chimpanzees and all these other species and say how much of these things are the same across mammals or across vertebrates or truly specific to human. And understanding that is a really um, interesting 
area in, in neuroscience. In fact, you know, what is it about the human brain that makes us have all these capacities? What do we have that the, the chimps don't have? Um, and actually there's a lot of that being done uh, at UC Santa Cruz um, by David Hausler's group. And the, the, a lot of the human genome work, really important work. I use the UC Santa Cruz genome browser almost every day, so. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Peter. Oh, you're muted. Peter, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, I have three other questions. Well, it's, one, it's mostly one question, right? Mostly, they're yeah. based on the same thing. The first thing is, do you name your mice? <laughs> <laughs> I don't name my mice, but I have one time my son named some of the mice. Um, one time uh, I brought in my older son who is now nine um, on the weekends with me to help me singly house mice. Cause when we test them on behaviors, we take them out of their group house and we put them in their own cages. And every cage of mice has a cage card on it that says when they were born and how old they are and all these things. And my son said, let's call this one Kevin because he's home alone. <laughs> So, <laughs> so that is the one mouse in my lab that has had a name. Okay. Um, but we do take very good care of them and make sure that they are happy and that they are euthanized in a painless way when we are done with them. Because um, having health, happy, healthy animals is important to having good data. And also, I just don't want to hurt anything. So. <laughs> that, that was the last question. What did, what did you? Was there more to that? Yes. What was the other part? Uh, the other part is, do you clean up after your mice? Like when they go out of a new, when they go to a new cage? Yeah, so there's actually a large staff. We have, their cages get changed every week. And we have, so in my lab, we have about, I don't actually know anymore. I think we have, we try to keep our cage count around 100, between 100 and 150. Um, because we're doing a lot of different experiments with the mice. So, um, so there's a lot of cages. You don't put more than five mouse mice in a cage. If there's, if there's a male and a female that make babies, then you just keep the family. And then when the babies are old enough, you take them out. You have to take them out before the next ones are born or it gets too crowded because they nurse and then you wean them and then you separate them out into male and female cages. And so it's a lot of work to keep track of them all and move them around. And then we have a lot of mice with mutations in them. You know, we have mice with mutations and estrogen receptor that they, the males don't develop the male behaviors properly because they can't respond to the hormone. So we have to keep track of everybody. Um, but we don't actually ourselves have to change the cages. We do move the mice around, um, but there are technicians that help keep the rooms tidy. Yep. The, the, the last one I think was, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay, I think we're ready. Okay. All right, so, um, let's see. Is everybody muted? Okay, so I, I hate having slides that are all text, but I just wanna give a little background uh, about things that we know about estrogen um, and its benefits for memory. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the last concept I mentioned, which is this idea of understanding the specificity of how estrogen is acting in the brain as opposed to other tissues and cell types. Um, and then I'm actually gonna take another break for questions after that, because we're progressively getting more technical here and into data. And I was gonna show you a little bit of our actual data and then we'll be done. Um, so um, there are a lot of things that we know about estrogen having positive effects on the brain, right? And um, but again, I, what I'm trying to understand are what are the genes that are activated by the estrogen receptor that leads to these benefits, right? So we know estrogen improves outcome following um, a ischemic stroke. If the brain's lacking oxygen, if there's estrogen around, that it helps this healing process better acutely. Um, estrogen decreases anxiety in both humans and rodents. So in, in women in the menstrual cycle, when you have high estrogen, it's, it's, more, it's positive for, for mood, um, low uh, causes more uh, mood and anxiety problems. And you can see this in rodents in the lab. So we can test anxiety in rodents in different behavior assays. One of these common assays, I should have brought a picture, it's called the elevated plus maze, but there's basically a plus and it's, it's a plus sign up off the ground and two of the arms of the plus have walls and two of them are open. And an animal will walk out into the open arms um, 
less if they are feeling stressed and anxious. So you can quantify how much time a mouse spends exploring this new space and how much they walk out on an open exposed arm versus hiding in the ones with the walls. And when you remove the ovaries from the females, they spend way more time hiding in the areas with the walls. Um, and there's other, there's other assays like that. Um, and uh, so it, it's well known that estrogen decreases anxiety, right? Um, hormone replacement therapy has positive effects on mood. Um, I've, I'll get into this, I think I might, I can't remember if I get into this more on the next slide or I should just say it now, right? So there was a large trial done, I think in the 90s, looking at the hormone replacement therapy and trying to weigh the pros and cons of postmenopausal women taking estrogen and progesterone because it does have all these beneficial effects, but it, they, these hormones can also pr promote tumor growth of reproductive cancers. And so trying to figure out, um, you know, is it better for some people that have high risk of cancer or low risk of cancer to try these different hormone replacement therapies? But um, it's definitely, you know, people who take these therapies largely report um, um, positive effects on their mood. And one of the problems actually with these therapies is that they are extremely crude hormones. So like the first hormone replacement therapy, I believe was Premarin, which is actually purified hormones from horse urine. Um, and they're not very specific, right? So there are many little versions and many kinds of estrogen, estradiol, estrone, estriol, and really understanding, you know, and being able to provide the correct hormone replacement therapy that would give these positive mood benefits without promoting tumor growth is another thing we're interested in. And I'll get more into that on the next slide. Um, hormone replacement therapy also en enhances the effects of antidepressants in postmenopausal women. So um, if you're on SSRIs and hormone replacement therapy, then your mood improves more. Um, and then blocking estrogen signaling reduces neural activity and decreases performance on memory tasks in both sexes. So again, this is rodent studies, um, but uh, both sexes, uh, like I said, there's um, aromatase in the male brain. I should actually say, no one asked me this. So this, this idea that estrogen is masculinizing in early life um, tends to, this is really more in rodents. It does seem like in primates, testosterone is working directly on androgen receptor in the brain more than being converted to estrogen. However, there is aromatase in the human male brain and there is estrogen being made in the human male brain. And one way that this has been studied is um, men that are on, um, men that are being treated for prostate cancer that are put on testosterone blockers. They can also add in aromatase blockers. And when they block um, both androgen receptor and the production of estrogen, then men's mood does worse than if they're just blocking the androgen receptor. So it seems like estrogen production in the male brain is important for a male mood uh, as well. Um, so I'm gonna talk more specifically about uh, the estrogen receptor cofactors now, because I think this is, this is interesting and hopefully everybody can follow along here. Um, so this is my little schematic of estrogen binding to its receptors. They always bind in a pair when they sit down on the DNA. And so these blue blobs that I put in the back are example kind of cofactors, other things that cooperate with estrogen receptor in cells to help it turn genes on and off, right? And so here I've drawn some blue blobs that are representing cofactors that help turn genes on. And so this little arrow here represents that the DNA is being made into RNA and then into proteins, and it's, it's a functional gene that's making something. Um, there are other factors that can bind instead that actually estrogen receptor still sits down, but it doesn't turn the gene on. And so understanding the on complex and the off complex in different kinds of cells is really, really important for developing targeted therapies, right? Because ideally what we would want to do is we would want to develop a way to turn on all of these genes that improve mood and neural function without turning on all of the genes that would regulate tumor growth. So these are very different genes. Um, estrogen promotes cell cycle, cell division in tumors, um, but something about neurons, the cells in your brain is that they don't divide. They are there forever. You are born with pretty much all the neurons you're going to have. They're all there in infancy. Um, and so estrogen is not promoting neuronal growth. Um, when people get brain tumors, they're almost entirely usually non-neuronal glial cells, not the neurons themselves. So neurons don't divide. So we're trying to understand what are these cofactors in the brain and how are they different from cofactors in the breast or uterus? Um, so some of you, um, many of you are probably familiar with um, tamoxifen, which is a breast cancer medication. It's marketed as Nulvidex. And so the way that these uh, breast cancer medications work is uh, many of them bind estrogen receptors directly. 
exactly where estrogen normally binds and causes them to make a slightly different shape than when estrogen is bound. So like here I drew this receptor shaped more like an L uh, and then here it's got a different shape. So when tamoxifen, the way that tamoxifen works is when it binds the receptor, it causes it to recruit this off complex in the breast. And so even though estrogen receptor is still there, it's got a different shape and it's recruiting this off complex. And in the breast, it's keeping its target genes off. The problem with tamoxifen is that in the uterus, there's a different repertoire of cofactors available. And the, in, even though um, tamoxifen is bound, it recruits a lot of this on complex instead. And so there's so, some kind of, um, there's always efforts in the pharmaceutical industry to develop better, um, they're called uh, SERMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators that will um, block the effects of estrogen in, in the breast and not promote the effects of estrogen in the uterus. And so a newer medication that's given um, is called, uh, Avista is, uh, is called Riloxifene. And so this is a newer version, a newer breast cancer medication, and this is anti-estrogenic in the breast and it's um, also anti-estrogenic in the uterus. Um, interestingly, what raloxifene, where it is pro-estrogenic is in the bone. And so another problem with blocking estrogen signaling is that it can lead to osteoporosis and you wanna have estrogen to promote healthy, dense bones. Um, and raloxifene is actually um, prescribed for osteoporosis because it does not pro promote tumor growth. It seems to be specific to promoting the on genes in bone, but not in the breast or in the uterus. Um, so another thing about these medications is many women that are taking them report neurological side effects. And it's because you're blocking estrogen receptor signaling probably in the brain as well, but we don't quite know yet. Well, we know now, because this is what my lab has figured out, what the genes are that are regulated by estrogen in the brain, right? So ideally it would be great if we could have this here be the, on, the good stuff, we wanna keep the good stuff on in the brain and we wanna keep the bad stuff off in the other tissues. And so we're doing a lot of research to understand which factors cooperate with estrogen receptors specifically in the brain with the goal of developing better medications by understanding genes that are regulated by estrogen just in the brain and the cooperating factors that are just in the brain. So does anybody have any questions about, whoops, any of that? And then my last few slides are actually gonna be about the data um, from these experiments. Okay, are there any, any questions about that? Yeah, a lot of these people have been in my molecular biology course and they're, they're almost PhD level molecular biology. <laughs> awesome. yeah. I wasn't sure with this particular group if everyone had done the biology or if it was, I, you know, I don't know, I don't wanna, if, whole, if I'm not making sense, then just ask me, or maybe everybody is like way beyond. That's great too. So, right. so anybody, anybody questions about that? Oh yeah. So uh, we got Peter. Uh, I, I, this is maybe a, a, a newbie question, but like, how do you actually see the shape that you were drawing there? Uh, is that a thing you look with a microscope or oh, you, no, how it's do you too detect small. that? Yeah. It's too small even for that. So we, we aren't really, that is really like uh, protein biochemistry. Looking at the structure of a protein is, is a whole other thing that we don't do ourselves. Um, I'm just drawing circle. I'm, the, I'm drawing circles and blobs cartoons on here, but the actual shape of the estrogen receptor is extremely well worked out and well known. Which part of it binds the hormone, which part of it binds the DNA. And understanding um, understanding protein structure is, a really important part of research and a really important um, important thing for pharmaceutical companies because you want to design drugs that can bind and you know compete or cooperate or antagonize or agonize these proteins that you care about. Um, but that is not so. People use um, yeah very powerful microscopes and uh, X-ray crystallography and things like that to figure out protein structures. But I mean, so you, when you are doing experiments, you just send that in and there's a lab that tells you how it's going. So yeah, or... I'm going to talk about what we do. I should have put in more technical background slides, but the experiments that we do is we, we want to look at the genes that are expressed in the cells after we give hormones or a control injection, right? So we want to say, so this idea that 
that certain RNA transcripts are made and then converted into protein, we use a lot of high throughput sequencing. So you can take a piece of tissue, grind it up, get all the RNA out of it, send it off and have it all sequenced. And then you can see where in the genome um, those short pieces of sequence uh, match up. So we don't ever actually see the individual molecules, but they can be sequenced and read out. And then you get, you get a, you know, a hundred bases in a row, and then you can say, where in the genome does this go? And then you get multiple copies of those and they pile up and they make little peaks and I'll show those. And so we can see, um, again, using the UC Santa Cruz genome browser or equivalent um, tools, um, you can look at all the population of all the genes that were expressed and you can compare your groups and say, well, wh which genes went up when we gave estrogen? Um, and then Got looking it. at the factors that interact is a little more complicated. You have to like grab you the protein you care about in the right kind of solution. And then hopefully it stays stuck to the other stuff. And then you can pull that down and split that apart and uh, do proteomics on those. But yeah, we, we do a lot of work with, with DNA and RNA and um, looking at, at large data sets and looking for differences between groups in the genes that you can see. A somewhat re related question. Um, you would mentioned, that, uh, or Barry had mentioned, that your, your son said that my mom's job is dissecting brains. And I'm wondering, if we go up several orders of magnitude, if there are anatomical differences in the neurons or glial cells, I guess the whole corpus callosum thing got debunked a, a, a years ago. Is there something that 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 uh, that you could put on a slide and say this is a male brain and this is a female brain? Yeah, I'm going to show that actually. Um, uh, there are a few regions in the mouse brain and a few, and this is conserved in mammals that have more neurons in the males compared to the females. A few very small regions. Um, and in the mice, we know what they do. In the people, we're not so sure. <laughs> um, um, you know, classically, the way people studied these things was, was a lesion study. Like if you poke a hole in this part of the brain, what can the animal not do anymore? And there's more sophisticated ways of doing that now where you're not physically poking a hole. You can, you know, turn, you can change neuronal activity and you can monitor neuronal activity and say, well, which neurons are firing when the animal's running around doing something? So now we can put little hats on them. We can put fluorescent molecules in their brains and put little hats on them with fiber optic cables. And when the mice are running around sniffing and mating and fighting, different parts of the brain will flash because those neurons are, are active. So can't do that in the people yet. <laughs> I think that was the end of those questions. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna get through my, yeah, these are my last few slides and I'm gonna, um, talk about how we get our data. So this is a schematic of the, um, did I share my screen? Wait a minute, I didn't, did I? Sorry. All right. Okay, so this is actually um, a photograph that, I mean, I took this image off of Google, I did not take this, but this is what a mouse brain looks like from the side. Um, I had a, picture earlier of, of a human brain. So a mouse brain, um, this, this stuff here on the top, these two hemispheres are the cortex. And it, with a human brain, most of what you see is the cortex, all that sulci and gyri, all that big good stuff that you see in a picture that you think looks like brain, that's all cortex. Um, the, the regions of the brain, like the hypothalamus, and, and the, this is the cerebellum here and the brainstem, these regions are, are um, you know, these are all very conserved in, in mammals and humans. Um, and the, the hypothalamus is one of the regions that we study that has a lot of these hormone receptors. And the hypothalamus regulates a lot of innate brain functions. It regulates, you know, it regulates these behaviors. It regulates parenting behavior. Um, you can stimulate parts of the, you can stimulate some of the estrogen receptor neurons in part of the hypothalamus and cause the mom to go pick up the pup. Um, um, but it also regulates um, metabolism, sleeping, um, respiratory rate, all these really fundamental physiological functions are, are in the, regulated by the hypothalamus. And um, uh, the hypothalamus of a mouse is really not that much smaller than the hypothalamus of a human. Like once these groups of neurons evolved, they were kind of, they pretty much stayed in the same sort of state um, throughout uh, like vertebrates and, and mammals. 
Um, so what I'm schematizing here is like, if you look at a male brain and a female brain, they, they really are exactly the same in terms of, except for a few, like two or three places in the brain. Um, and so what we do technically that, that makes our research um, successful is we use genetic tools that allow us to actually physically select just the estrogen receptor positive neurons. So one of the things that's been made it so hard to study what hormones are doing in the brain, um, right, there's two things. One of them is that, um, as I said, we know a lot about how estrogen receptor functions in breast cancer or even in uterine or ovarian cancers. And we know a lot about what androgen receptor does in prostate cancers, but that's because these cancers, you can grow them in a dish. You can have a bunch of cancer cells and you can get a dish and it's got millions of cells on it and you can take them out and do things to them and you can keep growing them. But the brain, you can't take out the brain and then get more brain from it. Like you take it out, it's done. Um, and the hormone receptors aren't in all of the brain cells. They're really only in a few sparse populations. And so one of the technical tricks that we do using mouse genetics is we pull out the estrogen receptor positive neurons and we only do our experiments on those. And so that dramatically increases the signal to noise and allows us to identify these sex differences or these estrogen receptor targets, right? So this is a cartoon, but functionally, this is what we're doing. We're just doing our work on the estrogen receptor neurons and even from very specific brain regions, not from the whole brain. Um, so we do molecular profiling, like the question that I was just asked by Peter. Um, we can identify genes um, or proteins that are in one sex and not the other. Um, and we can determine how these genes change during different life stages. Um, are the same genes in, expressed in estrogen receptor neurons in an adult as in a pup or when the animal's going through puberty. Um, and then once we find these candidates, we can, we can manipulate them. We can say, well, let's just get rid of this gene and then see what the animal does. Does it grow up with a different brain? Um, so this is, this is a pretty, um, this is a schematic now of a, a sideways slice up the middle of a mouse head. So um, here's the whole brain. These big things in the front are the olfactory bulbs. So there's a lot of neurons in here. Rodents are very olfactory driven creatures, whereas primates get all their visual, do all their, most of their social communication from vision. But um, mice, you know, like dogs do a lot of it from olfaction. So they have very big olfactory bulbs in the front. So this is a flipped, flipped view now. These are, this is uh, the olfactory bulb. This is the brain here. And one thing that I'm highlighting, so this is the whole skull now. So this is the, the, the top, you know, the tooth um, at the top. This is inside the nasal cavity. Um, and then this is the brain. And so I'm highlighting here brain regions. You don't have to remember the alphabet soup of their names, but what I'm highlighting is these are brain regions that we know control a lot of these innate behaviors that differ between the sexes. Um, and this has been done initially by these kind of old fashioned lesion studies. And then more recently um, by more sophisticated manipulations. But um, one thing that's really important and interesting is that because mice get their, their, their social information, is this a male or a female? Is this female in estrus? Is this a pup? Should I leave it alone? All of that stuff, those smells, um, as with many other mammals, come from these social pheromone cues that are detected in the roof of the mouth by this organ called the VNO. And those smells uh, go into part of the olfactory bulb that's just for detecting this important social communication information. You could all, they also smell, this is how animals smell predators, right? Anything where they, they urine mark or territory mark or anything in body fluids that can communicate something about, you know, what kind of animal this is or its, its social status, all that stuff gets processed in this part of the brain. Um, and one of the first passes of information for, um, so after the information leaves here, one of the first places it goes is this region called the BNST. And so we do a lot of work studying the BNST um, because the BNST is actually larger in males than it is in females. And this size difference is directly due to this exposure to early estrogen. We know that in mice. So when we have these, we, we, there's about 40% more neurons in this little brain region in males. And when we treat the females with estrogen at birth, they have a male-sized BNST when they grow up. And in fact, they have it even after about a week of age. Um, and so it's actually, this region's actually been looked at. Um, so this is a slide, a tissue section now <coughs> in humans. Um, and this region is larger, as I said, in humans, um, uh, in, in, in men compared to women. But this study um, also looked at um, men homosexual men and actually transgender uh, women. Um, and the, the men who um, 
transition to women actually had a smaller size of women size BNST in this study, right? And so these are, um, in mice, we know that this size difference is programmed in the first week of life. And these are adults that, um, you know, went, underwent gender reassignment, I, whether they didn't all necessarily undergo surgery or, or even have the same hormone treatment. It's really hard to do these postmortem studies. Um, but they did overall have a, a smaller BNST, like the size of women. So this, uh, someone asked early on about um, transgender individuals and this idea that, you know, people have when they're very young, that they, it's called gender dysphoria, that you're kind of in the wrong body. Um, and this study suggests that, you know, there's even an anatomic um, reason for that. Um, and that's not to say that every single person has the opposite size BNST if they, if they have gender dysphoria. Um, but there really does seem to be a, a scientific basis to that feeling that I think is very strong for people who have it, the gender dysphoria. Um, so we don't know how the BNST gets bigger in humans compared to what we do know in mice. There have been some studies just from brain imaging from MRIs that seem to suggest um, that this size difference actually develops after puberty in people. But there's, it's um, no one, it hasn't been investigated as much in uh, infants. It's really hard to do that. Um, so this is some of our data now. So you can see here, this is kind of like a kind of American football shape here. Um, this is one side. So these structures are all bilateral structures. So this is now a section of a mouse brain looking head on. Um, and this shape here, if you guys can see my pointer, um, is this same shape, right? So this thing is about the same size and shape in a mouse as it is in a human. And this is an example of a gene that we've identified in our screens as being acutely regulated by estrogen. So in this experiment, we had males and females and we removed their gonads left them for three weeks because that's how long it takes males to stop mating and fighting after you remove their testes. And then we gave them estrogen for four hours only. And then we cut out the BNST and we took just the estrogen receptor neurons and we said, what are the genes that changed with estrogen? And we did this sequencing and then you can go back and you can check individual genes and say, what does this really look like? And so here, this is, these two stripes here are, kind of, are, the, are the BNST. And this purple signal is the signal of the gene. This is actually the signal from the RNA um, in the tissue. And so you can see there's this dramatic increase in the purple signal in the BNST of this gene in females given estrogen. And this gene is, it's, you know, the names of these genes, I put them up, but, you know, um, this gene is interesting because this gene is actually known itself to turn other genes off. And this gene is induced by estrogen. Um, so we did this experiment uh, in both sexes, um, and you can see that this gene is induced by hormone in both sexes. This is another gene uh, that we're interested in. So I'm just giving you a few examples here. This is another real, gene. Where you... Real quick question: Was that uh, in estrogen at uh, like um, at early developmental stages, or yeah, like these are, estrogen? So the very first experiment we did is like what genes are turned on by estrogen. And like we did it with animals given an acute dose that was a very high dose. Now we're going back and just looking at these genes in the pups and saying under baseline conditions where we were actually doing, my graduate students doing this experiment in four day old pups now, where we have males, females, and females treated with estrogen on the day of birth. And we can see actually a lot of these same genes, right? But the first experiment that we did was to do this in the adults. And so, um, this is another gene where hopefully you can see that with no estrogen, the purple is very low in both sexes, but with estrogen, the purple is much stronger. And that's the purple is actually tagging the, the, the transcript, the RNA of this gene as it's been turned on. So one thing that's interesting is some of the genes that we found seem to be upregulated by estrogen in females, but not in males, or the upregulation in males is quite weak. So this was surprising to us because you think, okay, well, males and females, they have different levels of these hormones, but if you give them the exact same hormone, do they respond the same way or not? And, you know, because there's early, these hormones are doing things early, the hypothesis was that some things would not be the same because there are these sex differences that are set up in development. Um, and so this gene, we're, we're actually, we now have mice that are mutant for this gene and we're studying what happens to their brains. Um, because this gene you can see was turned up by estrogen only in the females and it was just not turned up very much in the males. Um, 
And this gene is interesting because it had previously been uh, studied largely in early brain development. It's involved in, in axon outgrowth and axon guidance, which is when the neurons are forming synapses with each other, they have to form these connections. And so we're very interested in this gene and how it could play roles in um, inducing more neuronal connections in adults in response to estrogen and why it is that we can't turn this gene up in the males. Um, and so then the last piece of data that I'm gonna show is kind of like our personal lab. My personal kind of quest in science has been really trying to understand where this estrogen receptor is sitting in the genome. Um, not just what are the genes, but like you can actually figure out physically where this receptor is sitting down on the DNA. Um, and we've been able to do that. And I was just gonna show one slide of this data. Um, and then this is the end, right? Cause this is like, getting pretty intense with data here. Um, but what I wanna highlight on this slide is exactly what I was talking about before. So um, we can see where the receptor is sitting, we can sequence every piece of DNA that is associated with the receptor. And when you take a population of cells and you sequence that, and then you can align all these little pieces to the genome and everywhere that they pile up, this peak is a signal. It's a signal of where the receptor was sitting in the genome. And so what my graduate student did, he got this to work um, in these small brain regions, um, figuring out where this receptor binds. And just for some context, you know, when people do these kinds of experiments in cancer cells, they normally do it in about 6 million cancer cells in a dish. And we were able to modify a technique and do this with about 300,000 neurons um, dissected from these mice that we've given estrogen to, um, dissected and purified out. And so one thing we, we thought was interesting, something my graduate student looked for, um, <coughs> was which genes does estrogen receptor sit on in the brain specifically? And so what we've highlighted in this figure is um, we took, we looked at all these other papers because people have been doing these kinds of experiments in non-neural tissues for a long time, but it's been, no one's been able to get it to work in the brain. And so um, this first gene here, PGR, that I'm highlighting, there's a peak that's right after this gene and PGR is actually progesterone receptor. And so one thing that we do know in all tissues is that estrogen receptor upregulates progesterone receptor. And this is part of the estrus, the menstrual cycle. Estrogen goes up first and then progesterone goes up, but it turns out estrogen turns up the receptor for progesterone. So it has something to sit on to bind to. Um, but you can see, we, we looked at all these other data sets and these little dashes here are just highlighting where this peak was in other people's data. Um, and so where we see ER alpha binding in our data, people have seen ER alpha binding near progesterone receptor in the uterus. This is actually, these ductules are actually in the male reproductive tract. So these are the, like the like the vas deferens, like people have done this experiment in those tissues, in mammary gland, uh, in liver, and even in aorta. So there's actually, estrogen receptor does a lot, whoops, to um, uh, in endothelial cells and, and can relate to cardiovascular disease as well. So you can see these two examples here. Um, this one is in all the tissues we checked. And then this other gene, GREB1, is only in a subset of them. But we see a large amount of genes, actually 60% of the sites that we see estrogen receptor binding to in the brain is, is unique. And these it's not binding to these genes in any other tissue that's ever been investigated. Um, so this is really uh, um, important to us. And we're writing this data up for publication now. Um, because we've identified specific targets, we can now see how estrogen can be contributing to changes in brain function because we can see the actual genes that the receptor is sitting on. And we can also see how many of them are quite different from these non-neural tissues. Um, so just to conclude, you know, our, our next experiments we wanna do is to determine the estrogen target genes, um, like your question actually just now, in the early life brain and in the adolescent brain. So we did this experiment in adults, but what would happen now if we didn't treat them, um, if we just looked at baseline hormone levels? And what would happen, do we see the same genes in the pup as we do in the adult? It, it, well, actually for now it looks like we do. Um, and then what are the other targets of these other hormone receptors? So what is that? what are the androgen receptor target genes? How are they different from the estrogen receptor genes? And then also cortisol, the stress hormone, it also has a nuclear hormone receptor called glucocorticoid receptor. And we wanna know the targets of that stress receptor in the brain. Um, and then in the long term, you know, understanding these brain specific hormone receptor complexes can help us potentially develop new therapeutics for neurological and, and psychiatric disease where we can really get the positive benefits of these hormones um, without promoting any tumors. 
So I just want to acknowledge my um, funding um, and then my three graduate students and my uh, outstanding uh, lab manager kind of super technician that's in my lab. And um, thanks for your questions. This has really been fun and I'm happy to take more of them. All right. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was fabulous. And uh, part of the message always is in the end, it's very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Questions. For, well, I, I, let me ask one here. Where do we stand with pheromones in humans? That is, there's a, that is a good question. And so this, this, or, this vomeronasal, this VNO organ is, is very atrophied in humans, but it's still there. It's called the Jacobson's organ. And there's been a lot of studies actually um, investigating um, human preferences of smells of other humans, right? So <laughs> some of you might've heard about these t-shirt tests, right? Where women at different phases of their cycle will prefer the smells of different men. Um, and there's this idea actually, um, that when you are fertile, you prefer, um, out group odors more than in group odors. Um, so that, right. So that if you, um, if you're, if you're ovulating and you have the potential to produce offspring, it's better to be around males that are not closely related to you. So you can have a, a nice hybrid, bigger offspring. But then if you're not ovulating, it's actually better to be around the ones you know, because it's better to be with your people in your group the rest of the time, and they'll probably take better care of you than random strangers. And so this is the kind of the, the sociological theory behind this. Um, certainly animals can learn the smell, males can learn the smell of uh, females, um, whether they're in estrus or not, and then they'll know to go and find the estrus ones. But, um, but yeah, this idea that um, can do humans, do we smell each other and, and does that influence our opinions of each other and or our behaviors towards each, each other is 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 interesting? Yeah. Hey, well, out group in group kind of a discussion. This is going to be a real stretch, but maybe there's a little a little tidbit you've learned there. I'm I'm wondering if if you're looking at mice or any of the other uh, you know kind of models you've done, if there's if you can almost have like uh, conservative and liberal mice. And what I mean by that is that the conservatives would be. Uh, it's a very Santa Cruz question. Fearful and disgust, because uh, we know that there's some correlations there. Uh, they'd be very territorial and aggressive, and they'd want to live in rural areas, not yeah. with people in their cage. And the liberal mice would be uh, not as fearful, more inclined to live in crowded cages. Uh, more, it's almost the out-group, in-group kind of a thing. And whether that might be moderated by hormonal differences or maybe male-female differences, is there the, the scintilla of uh, 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 any any uh, uh, thing you've learned in that? So I don't have any relationship for sex hormones to that, but you can actually. Um, there are species. There's another vole species. There's a meadow vole species, um, and its propensity to be social is influenced by day length. And there's a few of these rodents where, in the summer, when the days are long. They are territorial and they stay away from each other. And then in the winters, when the days are short, they actually live in groups. And you can think about why this would be advantageous to do one or the other, but it's a really fun thing to study in the lab because you can just change the light cycle in the animal's rooms and you can have the same animal be territorial to, you know, and fight whoever shows up versus you can, they'll all snuggle in a cage together, just depending on how long the lights are on during the day. So there definitely are in, uh, cues that can influence social behavior. The environment can influence social behavior. Uh, Darby? Yeah, I mean, some of you already know this, I'm sure you're in related fields, but you've mentioned the pharmaceutical industry a few times. Yeah. And I'm wondering, uh, obviously they would benefit greatly from your research. And I don't know how that works and do they pay for it when they get it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, the, so many universities, um, you know, the, there's technology transfer offices. I haven't quite, I have to get the, yeah, maybe we'll see. We'll see if they call me when the data, data come out. Right. Um, but there are, um, oftentimes there are alliances between companies and, um, labs directly because that's the thing, right? This is taxpayer funded research. Exactly. Um, and then the companies can sort of, you know, take it and develop the drug and sell it for a lot of money, um, way more than most people can afford. Um, but, um, uh, companies have their own like R and D departments, but yes, you can, there are formal ways for research universities to enter into contracts with companies where companies will, um, give you money specifically to, to 
do this one kind of thing for them and then they can take the results right so you it's very tricky patent your, patent your findings can't you yeah um it's very well you can't patent genes per se you can patent tricks right but you can't say this is something that you know i can't remember when this went to court and what the gene was but the idea that a company can say oh we have the sequence for this gene and so it's ours now and anything that uses it i mean when people before things were really sequenced um the whole genome was sequenced people were trying to patent individual genes and you you can't do that right it doesn't make any uh, sense but yeah um certainly knowing what these targets are and then you know, taking a bunch of co compounds that a company already has and seeing how they affect these genes, right? One thing actually we've started to do in the lab is give the mice tamoxifen and raloxifen and then say, okay, how do these things in the brain change when we give them these widely used medications? That's the next phase for us as well, because we want to, we, that I think will be, you know, really important to know. Okay. Uh, Peter, the other Peter. Peter's hey, <clears throat> this has been fascinating. Um, so when astronauts go to space, they I've heard reported a few times that when they first see the Earth, it, it is a striking perspective that changes the way they see humanity in the context of the space and the Earth and the thin line that it sustains us all. Jessica, you study the influence of chemistry on the brain and how that changes behavior. How has that affected your parenting? <laughs> well, I guess uh, uh, as a scientist, I try to be an empirical parent anyway, but um, I do, I don't know. I have two boys and they're very different. Um, I'm trying to think if it's my research that has affected my parenting specifically. I think it's more just my approach to life in general in terms of trying to, you know, get all the data and make a informed decision rather than reacting in instinctively. But I think I fail at that a fair amount of the time with my children. Um, I think I, I think one of the fun things about science is it, it does give you a perspective on, on humanity and it's a privilege to be able to do this kind of work, right? I get to play around and ask questions that I think are interesting and that's my job. Um, so I, I guess, what I do impart to my kids is that, you know, I, I work a lot, but it's something that I'm doing because it's fun and they think it's fun. And it's also really neat because we know so many other scientist families, um, their friends have parents that do a different kind of science. And so the fact that that is normalized to them, I, I really appreciate. And actually for myself, you know, I spent a lot of time on the UC Santa Cruz campus when I was young. Um, and I think growing up in Santa Cruz actually made me become a scientist because it's a college town. There's a lot of young people. I was exposed to stuff, I think, much more uh, than many kids are. I think my my dad took me up to see Stephen Hawking lecture when I was 10 because he was on campus. Um, oh, I was amazing. part of a young astronomer. I was a part of an astronomy club that like met at Bonnie Dune Airport. I think I was like the only kid. Um, I went to a Star Trek blooper fest. Um, you know, all these things about Santa Cruz being in that kind of academic intellectual environment, having all these people around, I think helped me become a scientist. So I appreciate having that background and I hope I, you know, can, I hope I use some of that knowledge in how I parent, but I don't know. <laughs> well, I just, I just mean like, you know, sometimes I feel like, uh, as a parent and maybe as a human in the world. Uh, I, I see someone's behavior and think of it as this is who they are. And as a parent, my impetus is, oh, I better change this thing about who this little person is. But then what I see in your in, in what you're presenting today and in, in, in thinking about this is, well, actually, we're not this. We're not uh, static. We are influenced heavily by by chemical changes all the time. In the way you go about the world and reacting to people, if you have that at the top of your mind all the time, I imagine that's a little different than than those of us who don't think about that very often and consider people as being static. You know, I would think the thing that's affected me the most is um, you know the idea that these early life experiences can have really lasting effects on the brain. And so some of the work we're starting to do now, actually, with our voles, is you know if 
um, these voles make these amazing pair bonds, but if they have early life stress, it attenuates their ability to form that pair bond. Mm -hmm. And so that is a really interesting model system for, you know, all of these kids out there that maybe are not living in stable situations or don't have the resources or their parents don't have the resources and really just um, how important it is for those early life moments. Like they set up brain chemistry for life and they, they set up your stress response for life. Um, and I think, you know, trying to be proactive about communicating that to the public is an important part of my job. Okay, so mm -hmm. Peter, Peter Marks, you wanna wrap this up? Well, this has been absolutely fantastic, Jessica, thank you. And I think we probably owe a little bit of thanks to Garrett, and if your mom's made it here too, you, uh, uh, you were part of something great. So, so <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, uh, for the rest of the group, we'll meet again, and I think we just a little bit of applause here. Really appreciate it. And, thanks everyone. Uh, Barry will put out the link, and uh, if you uh, care to send that out to others, uh, Jessica, you know, feel free and the rest of that. Uh, it was a great talk, lots to think about, and uh, we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thanks. I, I appreciate it, too, because it makes it better for me. Like, if I like being able to engage with the public because it makes my questions better for my own research, so it's really valuable. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. All right. All right. See everyone next month. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. We should have some more. Barry um, or um, Peter. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is this, I noticed this has been recorded. Is this uh, available? Will this be available to us? I wanted to. Yes. Okay, great. So. Uh, we'll we'll send out a link. Okay, yeah. great. Because I wanted to send this up to my uh, doctor son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, there's a lot of uh, spinoffs here. I mean, this whole idea of secure attachment uh, being important to voles and people, and uh, 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 a lot of a uh, lot of things to think about here. Exactly. Thank you very much. All right. Cheers. Bye. Yeah. Uh, Good to see you, Peter. Yeah, this was really amazing. This was so fun. Yeah. Great. You did a great <laughs> job. You know, was, you always have to be worried a little bit about the, whether the level would be wrong, but I mean. The whole first part was fabulous, and then she gave us some real meat at the end. And so. Well, we actually recognized those graphs thanks to uh, probably two or three sessions here in your own uh, microbiology <laughs> course. So that was good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. But, all right. See you all. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you.